This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. I want to welcome you to worship here at Gloria Day on this seventh Sunday after Pentecost. And what a glorious day it is to gather as God's people. A six-year-old girl asked her grandmother, Grandma, when you die, can you ask God something for me? Sure. What do you want me to ask? The grandmother replied. I want you to ask God if dragons are for real. Well, how am I supposed to uh, let you know what God says, the grandmother said. Just text me, the girl said. (laughs) Don't be a ghost, because if you're a ghost, that would scare me. I like that. So some of you have read children's letters to God. Here's somebody's take on dogs' letters to God, uh, being the 4th of July, that's always a traumatic day for our pets, especially our dogs. We have to do all kinds of things to calm them down. So here are some imaginary letters from dogs to God. Dear God, when we get to heaven, can we sit on your couch, or is it the same old story? (laughs) Dear God, when we get to the pearly gates, do we have to shake hands to get in? Dear God, are there dogs on other planets, or are we alone? I've been howling at the moon and stars for a long time, but I never hear back, and actually all I hear back is the basset hound across the street. (laughs) Dear God, are there mail carriers in heaven? If there are, will I have to apologize? (laughs) Hey, let's take a moment to turn to our neighbor to our left and right, tell them how glad we are that they're here. Following our service, we'll be gathering in the fellowship hall for a time of fellowship. We hope that you can stick around for that and share a little bit about how God has been active in your experience. Right now, I'd like to invite you to stand as we join in our opening hymn. The question is not whether you are a calling God. 
You call, you invite, you inspire, you challenge. The question is whether we are a responding people. Whether we are open to your guiding spirit. Whether we quiet our hearts to hear your voice. Whether we are willing to be conformed to your will. Continue calling God to gift us, equip us, nurture us, challenge us. Yes, yes, continue, continue to, to call us for the sake of a world that needs the gifts you've planted within us. And when we're slow to respond, keep whispering, keep, keep, keep pestering, keep pestering keep provoking and prodding, keep, keep calling, calling keep, keep inviting, inviting response. response. Until our hearts are quieted to hear your voice and open to your guiding spirit, and willing to be conformed to your will. Until together we dance, step by step, you in the lead, call and response. Amen. Amen. We live for the praise of your glory. Please join me in the prayer of the day. We pray together. God, God of the covenant, covenant in, in our, our baptism, baptism, you call us to proclaim the coming of your kingdom. kingdom. Give, Give us, us the courage, courage you gave the apostles, apostles that, that we may faithfully witness, witness to your love, to your love and, peace and peace in every circumstance of life. In the name of Jesus Christ, Christ our, our Savior and our Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. Congregation may be seated. In 1597, before the Common Era, the priest Ezekiel was removed into exile in Babylon. While there, he received a vision of God appearing majestically on a chariot throne. Today's reading recounts God's commissioning of Ezekiel during this vision. The prophet is to speak God's word to a people unwilling to hear. The reading today is from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, and here begins the reading. 
<clears throat> he spoke to me, O mortal, stand up on your feet and I will speak with you. And when he spoke to me, a spirit entered into me and set me on my feet, and I heard him speaking to me. He said to me, Mortal, I am sending you to the people of Israel, to a nation of rebels who have rebelled against me. They and their ancestors have transgressed against me to this very day. The descendants are impudent and stubborn. I am sending you to them, and you shall say to them, Thus says the Lord God, whether they hear or refuse to hear, for they are a rebellious house, they shall know that there has been a prophet among them. Here ends the reading. Christians do not boast in their own accomplishments. Rather, Christians boasting focus attention on how the powers of Christ is present in our lives, especially in times of weakness and vulnerability. No matter what our circumstances in life, Christ's grace is sufficient for us. Today's second reading is from the second book of Corinthians, chapter 12, verses 2 through 10. I know a person in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up in the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that such a person, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. We caught up, was caught up in paradise and heard things that are not to be told, that no mortal is permitted to repeat. On behalf of such a one, I will boast, but not on my own behalf, I will not boast, except of my weaknesses. 
But if I wish to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will be speaking the truth. But I refrain from it, so that no one may think better of me than is seen in me or heard from me. Even considering the exceptional character of the revelations, therefore to keep me from being too elated, a thorn was given to me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I appealed to the Lord about this, that it would leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is made perfect in weakness. So I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Here ends the reading. gospel for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from Mark, the sixth chapter, beginning with the first verse. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. In today's gospel, we have two stories that are quite uh, contrasting. Okay, we have a story about Jesus' return to his hometown, and like an earlier uh, trip, it doesn't end too well. The very people you think would be supportive of his ministry turn out to be not so supportive. But then Jesus does something really creative with this set of circumstances and sends the 12 out to continue doing work that up to that point he had been doing individually. Please join me in the reading of this gospel text. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown, and among their own kin, and in their own house. All he could do, no deed of power there, except that he laid hand on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went about among the villages teaching. He called the twelve and began to send them out two by two, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you, as you leave, Shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Congregation may be seated.
young man named Jared was intrigued by the idea of becoming a parish pastor. He came from a close family who were supportive of this career path, so when he had completed his undergraduate studies, he headed off to seminary. After finishing seminary, he came back home before beginning his first call. He visited his family and his relatives for about a week. Jared stopped by the church he grew up in to talk to his hometown pastor. Jared said uh, that he was uh, really excited about his first call, and the pastor asked him, hey, how would you like to preach this coming Sunday? He said he would be honored. Sunday morning came, and after, of course, many hours of preparation, since this was one of his early forays in the pulpit, he uh, got up to preach, and... Uh, just at that point, uh, he looked around at all these faces and began then to expound on the gospel text. Well, he had hardly begun when his young niece, Kathleen, who was about six years old, stepped out into the aisle, put her hands on her hips, stuck her foot out in front of her, and cocked her head a little bit to the side. And then in a loud voice so that everybody could hear her, she said, Uncle Jared! You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I don't know how that young man finished his message. <laughs> but undoubtedly, it was an experience that he never forgot. It's hard to impress people that know you really well. When Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth in today's gospel, everyone was in a state of heightened anticipation. One of their own had made quite a name for uh, himself. Word had come back from the nearby towns and villages that Jesus was a great preacher, that he was performing all kinds of miracles, and that everywhere he went, he was drawing huge crowds. So people were curious, right? They wanted to find out what one of their own had been up to. So they came out in large numbers to hear him speak. And hopefully to do the same kinds of things in Nazareth that he was doing in the northern region of the Galilee. Jesus 
didn't hold back. He shared with those who had gathered what God was about to do, not only in their community, but throughout the entire region. A new day was dawning, he said. An old era was ending. God was going to reverse the fortunes of his people, and Jesus himself was going to be at the forefront of this new thing that God was doing. The people in the synagogue could hardly believe what they were being told. These were bold and provocative claims, especially from someone that they had seen grown up in their very midst. Instead of being impressed, they became angry, even upset. They started muttering ugly things to one another. Where did Jesus get this stuff? Who does he think he is, performing miracles and claiming to speak for God? Isn't this Mary's son, the carpenter, the village handyman? We've known him since he was just a kid. He's nobody special. Talk about a major letdown. I think these are some of the saddest words you will ever hear about Jesus' ministry. Because these acquaintances and family members knew a little bit about Jesus' previous history, they were oblivious to the new thing that God was now about to accomplish in Jesus' ministry, especially to people on the margins. They really didn't have a clue about the marvelous gift of grace that Jesus was ready to offer. And consequently, they took offense at him and were unable to hear anything that he had to say. William Mule of Yale Divinity School tells of visiting a fine old ancestral house in Virginia. The aged owner was the last of a distinguished colonial family, and she was probably showing him through the house all the different uh, uh, pieces of furniture that dated way back and so forth. Well, over the fireplace, he noticed an ancient rifle or musket, which intrigued him. He asked if he might take it down and examine it. And his host said, oh, I'm afraid that wouldn't be safe. You see, it's loaded. My great-grandfather kept it there in constant readiness against the moment when he might strike a blow for the freedom of the colonies. Professor Mule said, then he died before the revolution came? No, she answered. He lived to a ripe old age and died in 1802. But he never had confidence in George Washington. <laughs> you see, he knew him as a boy, and he didn't believe that he could ever lead an army. Jesus had the same problem. Those who had known him as a boy could not believe that he could be God's anointed. The story about Jesus' rejection at the hands of his own townspeople gives us a disturbing reminder that it is perfectly possible to have something standing right before you and not recognize its importance. Remember the often told story of the casting session of Fred Astaire and the comment written by the director at the time? Can't act, can't sing, dances a little bit. In 1902, the Atlantic Monthly's poetry editor, editor returned a batch of poems to a 28-year-old 20 year poet with a bitter note. Our magazine has no room for your vigorous verse. The poet, Robert Frost. And that happens again and again and again, doesn't it? Now it was Jesus' turn to be astounded and amazed. He came back home hoping to find a receptive crowd, eager to join him in the work that God had called him to do, and instead he found a group of people quick to criticize and eager to put him in his place. In response to their rejection, Jesus says, only in his hometown, among his relatives and his own house, is a prophet without honor. Ouch! That experience has got to hurt. And I'm sure Jesus really felt terrible about this situation. In her novel, Meridian, Alice Walker tells how the heroine, whose name is Meridian, one day found a piece of heavy metal that was covered all over with rust. To her amazement and surprise, 
she found that her new possession was actually a bar of gold. Imagine that, finding a bar of gold. She rushed home to her mother, who was sitting on the back porch shelling peas, and placed a large, heavy bar on her mother's lap. And her mother said, Meridian, move that thing. Can't you see that I'm trying to get these peas ready for supper? Meridian then turned to her father. And after that, she turned to the rest of the members of her family. And finally, she turned to the other members of her neighborhood. No one was interested in sharing this marvelous treasure. And so, uh, she was really depressed because all they could see was a big hunk of rusty metal. Meridian had something wonderful to share, but she was rejected by those closest to her, people that were her family and her closest friends. Eventually, Meridian took the bar of gold and placed it in a shoebox, and she buried it under a big magnolia tree in her backyard. And once a week, she would dig it up and look at it. And as the days went by, she dug it up less and less until finally she forgot to dig it up at all. It went back into the ground. How easily that could have happened to Jesus in the face of so much opposition and negativity. But Jesus was no ordinary carpenter. After taking a moment to regroup with his followers following the fiasco at Nazareth, Jesus does something both constructive and extremely hopeful. He expands the scope of his ministry by commissioning the Twelve to go out and do what he himself had previously been doing all on his own. He sent them off into the surrounding area with these instructions. Don't think you need a lot of extra equipment for this. You are the equipment. No special appeals for funds. Keep it simple. And no luxury inns. Get a modest place and be content there until you leave. If you're not welcome, not listened to, quietly withdraw. Don't make a scene. Shake the dust from your feet and be on your way. Instead of allowing his family and childhood acquaintances to do a number on his self-esteem, Jesus uses this experience in Nazareth to propel his ministry to an entirely new level by equipping his followers to share in the work that he knows is vital to the expansion of God's new agenda. Because of his close relationship with his heavenly father, Jesus is able to recognize that when an individual encounters resistance to their God-given vocation, the best response isn't to panic, isn't to give up or become discouraged, but to be faithful to the vision which God has planted in their hearts and also in their imagination. As anyone who's ever received a God-sized dream will tell you, resistance and oppositions to dreams are inevitable, right? And sometimes they'll come from the people that we don't expect, the people who are closest to us, the people we think are our allies. That was Jesus' experience when he returned to his hometown. The people who we think should have been his greatest supporters turned out to be a bunch of naysayers and stick in the muds. Mark tells us that Jesus wasn't able to do much of anything in Nazareth, but that didn't stop the ministry of Jesus from expanding and blessing the lives of all the people who lived nearby. When Jesus experienced rejection and opposition, he turned his energies elsewhere. As the family and hometown of Jesus make clear, we need to be very careful about how we view those in our circle of influence. In other words, the people sitting next to us, the people we encounter in our daily life, at the check stand or as we're going about our daily tasks. A representative of the kingdom may be sitting right next to us, and we are oblivious because they don't match our picture of how God likes to do God's best work. If we want to get in on what God is doing in the present moment, then we must look past people's ordinariness and their familiarity. 
in God's eyes, every person has incredible worth. Regardless of their background or past history or anything else about them, the people of Nazareth missed that key insight. And because of their short sightedness, they missed the Messiah and the great things that he could have accomplished in their midst. May that never happen to us. And all God's people said, Let's stand for the hymn of the day. One in the communion of saints and in the power of the Holy Spirit, we join our voices in prayer. Glorious God, you bend down to wash the feet of your disciples. Let the servant church arise in our teaching, our praying, our healing, and our doing. Make all your faithful people powerful in weakness and strong in grace. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Life giving God, your fingers trace the heavens and your hands mold the earth. Where there is drought, bring nourishing rain. Where there is devastation from fire or flood, bring relief. Sustain the well being of every living thing. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Merciful God, you speak and the nations listen. Open those who govern to the cries of all who journey with no food or shelter, particularly people fleeing violence, those seeking freedom, and those in search of community. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Gracious God, you embrace being Your embrace brings wholeness to those who are troubled. Anoint all who suffer in any way with the oil of healing and grant them renewal. In your mercy, hear hear our our prayer. prayer. Welcoming God, in your presence strangers become companions and enemies become neighbors. Open our doors to those who we have so easily shut out particularly people who are different from us or who are marginalized by church or society. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. Eternal God, you gather us into your house of many dwelling places. We give you thanks for our faithfully departed. Inspire us 
by their lives of faith until, with them, we rest forever at our journey's end. In your mercy. Hear our prayer. prayer. Holy God, holy and merciful, in your outstretched arms we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in the one who is the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you always. And also, and also with, with you. you. Let us share that marvelous peace with one another. God's peace. peace. Let us pray. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. You bring forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts, that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times. And in all places, give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection, opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join in their unending hymn.
Holy, mighty, and merciful Lord, heaven and earth are full of your glory. In great love you sent to us Jesus, your Son, who reached out to heal the sick and suffering, who preached good news to the poor, and who on the cross opened his arms to all. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Pour out your Holy Spirit, that by this holy communion we may know the unity we share with all your people in the body of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him, with him, in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Please join me in the prayer our Savior taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Teresa Burleson shares these words. He is the laughter of God, still calling us to leave our nets, to see with a child's eyes, to take the risk of radical love. And those who will be poured out, he turns to wine. Regardless of what frustrations and complications you may be experiencing in life, Jesus invites you to come to this table and experience firsthand his uh, unbelievable love. What a great gift. And as we receive that love, it's transformative. It assists us in becoming the kind of people who can reach out and share that love of God with those we encounter in our daily experience. And this table is where we're equipped for that. It's where, again, the friendship of God becomes real to us as we tangibly touch it in bread and drink from it in wine and understand that closeness that God offers. So as you come forward today, I encourage you to think about that great gift being offered and how in its reception, we too are turned to wine. For the distribution, I invite you to come down the aisle to my right where I'll be waiting with the bread. After receiving the bread, there'll be identical stations on each side of me where you can receive wine or grape juice. The wine's the darker color, the grape juice is the lighter. If you're uncomfortable coming forward, uh, you're also free to take smaller cups, uh, gluten-free wafers or bits of bread in the back and take them in your seat. Come, for all is now ready.
And now may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and preserve you in his most precious grace. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. O God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your Spirit, that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The congregation may be seated, and at this time I'd like to invite those with birthdays or anniversaries to please come forward. Happy anniversary to you, happy anniversary to you, may the Lord bless and keep you, love and care for you too. Congratulations. Congratulations. At this time, we have a special announcement from our bishop who is uh, with us today for worship. Welcome, Bishop Brenda. Hey, it's me. Is that on? Hi, everybody. Uh, My name is Brenda Boss, and I serve as the fifth bishop of the Southwest California Synod, and I have to tell you, this worship service this morning has been the healing I didn't know I needed. (laughs) I am so delighted to be here. I can't say I'm surprised in any way. I've been at Gloria Day probably three or four times but always for Central Coast Conference meetings or when I first, I think either before I was elected, Bishop came to meet Pastor Greg. I had not known him before. And I'm not at all surprised because there's always so much welcome and so much delight in the Lord here. And maybe you don't know it because you're just being church, right? (laughs) But I am just delighted at how much joy and how much faithfulness there is. Worship team, oh my gosh, thank you. Ray, wow. Wait till okay. you try the cheesecake. In oh, and there's oh. cheesecake. It's all too much. But, you know, Ray, I'm thanking you just for 
being a great reader. I mean, that was just proclamation all day long. And I want to thank you for that. Because again, we get so into like, I don't know, we're just being church. There's something beautiful and important happening here. And again, I'm not surprised because Pastor Greg also has always been so warm, so joyful, so faithful when I speak with him. And so, again, it makes sense. It's on brand. (laughs) But thank you. Thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being a Christian witness in Santa Maria. When I was a child, my father was a cattle truck driver. And he came through Santa Maria a lot. And he wanted to move here. We lived in the Inland Empire before it was called the Inland Empire. We lived in Chino, which was a place with a lot of dairies. And he was up here a lot. And, he, and I remember as a child, him saying to my mother, I really want to move to Santa Maria. And I think she didn't want to leave her parents. But I wonder, right? I wonder about if I had been here because this place captured his heart and his imagination. And every time I'm here, I think, yeah, this matters to my family in a way that I, I, I don't even understand completely. I mean, not that I can't get it. I get it. But, like, I, why did he want to move here, you know? He just loved it. So it's good to be with you today. I actually don't have a special announcement. I'm really just here to visit. This is one of the maybe handful of the 105 congregations I'd never been to on a Sunday. So I'm really just here to celebrate and enjoy you. And I'm just so, so glad to be here. I, I did want to talk just for a second about Iglesia Luterana Santa Cruz because I want you to know that their departure broke my heart. I loved that congregation, and I know you do. And I have said in a lot of spaces, and I want to say it here, I'm hoping that you're still loving and supporting them. And I don't ever want you to think you have to sneak around my back and like, oh, they're not ELCA anymore. You know what? The Christian and wonderful thing to do is to see that there's a ministry there, and those people are transforming lives. And so I just wanted to say that out loud. And if, if, if they ever want to come back, oh my God, I would break the door down to let them have it. I would love, love, love them to be back in the ELCA because, again, I think they're an important ministry and I'm devastated that they left. And I I have to say there were many, many factors and I'm worried that actually part of what my office did was not reactive enough or not supportive enough and I will be haunted by that forever and will continue to talk to God about that and ask for God's guidance. But again, I just want to say thank you for what you're doing here, what you're doing there. And I know for many of our congregations, you know, the place used to have more people in it. And I wish that was different. But this is one-seventh of the week. And I'm praying that what happens here and the way that you are filled up and the way that you are encouraged by the preaching and the teaching and the music and the people inspires you and you go out and you love your neighbor. Because I think that's what God is doing. I think God is saying, thank you for Sunday. The work's out there, friends. And so I just want to encourage you to be loving, to be kind, to be curious, to ask that that hymn of the day after the sermon. That was incredible. Ask the hard questions and trust that God is with you in those things. But thank you. I have said, I have bragged about you away from here, and I will, so I will say it to your face. Whenever I'm in the Central Coast, I marvel at the spirit in this place, not just in Gloria Day, but throughout. The conversations that we have with your laity, with your pastors, with your deacons, it's incredible. God is so, so active here, and I just want to thank you and let you know I see it. Thanks be to God. evangelism. Uh, That'll be after the fellowship time. We're going to be making our way through this book, Unapologetic. I have lots of copies, so I hope to see some of you back here uh, for that discussion following the fellowship time. Okay, that's coming up. Any other announcements? Is ladies' lunch. All ladies are invited to attend. It'll be a at noon at the Swiss, but please sign up so I know how many uh, to make a reservation for. Uh, If you're going to the play on Friday, I have your tickets. Um, And next Sunday is a fun day. We're having our barbecue after church and games, so come in in your play clothes. We're going to have a lot of fun, lots of games. And also, there is a show coming up uh, August 2nd, Cabaret in Solvang, and I've had a lot of interest so if you're interested in going that, please sign up right away. We have a former member, Sonia Demeter, who wants to bring her family too, so that it would be fun. So I, if I need to get more tickets, I need to know right away. 
Thanks. And I just have a note. Um, it says Sunday, July 27th, which is both right, because on Saturday, July 27th, the pickleball ministry is going to make the enchiladas, and you can pick them up for your Saturday night dinner, or you can pick them up on Sunday morning after church to take them home. They will be um, made and cooked, and you just take them home and reheat them. And we appreciate you so much. Our pickleball ministry has paid off our court. I hope you come down and play. Now we're just getting more money to buy grass. The <laughs> kind you walk on. <laughs> yes. Good question. I'll give you a call. <laughs> yeah. On the kiosk. Please stand for the blessing. On our hearts and on our homes, the blessing of God. In our coming and in our going, the peace of God. In our lives and in our seeking, the love of God. At our end and new beginning, the arms of God to welcome us and bring us safely home. Amen. Amen. Peace, you are the body of Christ. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.